like to call Frontier Regional joint meeting at 6.03 for October 5th, 2021. Okay. And we will call the Union 38 Joint School Committee meeting to order at 6.03 p.m. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity, as pointed out to me by uh, Jessica Corwin, that this is International Teachers Day, so designated. Um, and uh, we should uh, recognize our teachers with a, a big thank you. <clears throat> so Absolutely. <laughs> Um, so I'd like to start the meeting by um, suggesting a change to the agenda by moving our number three public comment uh, to number 1A and uh, start with public comment this evening. We have five uh, people who have requested uh, being able to speak for public comment, so I will call each one in the order that I received them in a list um, more than anything. So we could start if Lou Vincent is on. I see that right in front of me. Um, we could have Lou Vincent. Or maybe not. <laughs> is Lou, Lou, are you out there? There's something going on with your audio. And while she's trying to figure out her audio, I'm going to uh, just also note that this is a public meeting or a virtual public meeting and that the session is being recorded. Any luck, Lou? <laughs> no. Might I suggest maybe if you sign out and try signing back into the meeting, Lou, and we'll get back to you. Um, we'll move on to, is Jennifer Smith on? I thought I saw her name. I am, thank you. I hope my sound sounds okay. <laughs> that was funny. <laughs> your your sound is fine with me. Okay, great, I'll get started then. <clears throat> um, Good evening, everyone. My name is Jennifer Smith. I'm a fourth grade teacher at DES. You may remember hearing from me last year as I spoke often about the professional development offerings that were created and completed last year in the elementary schools. That PD consisted of two pathways, identity and white privilege, and the history of racism that all the elementary school teachers in the district were required to choose from and complete one of the pathways in small groups over about 10 weeks. It was a transformative experience and one that I wanted to share with more people. As leaders in your community and decision makers for your school and for the children in them, I really wanted to provide you with the opportunity to have the same transformative experience that the teachers did. Last spring, I worked with the Deerfield Inclusion Group to set up study groups with the first pathway for the DES and FRS school committees. Then Jessica Corwin reached out to me and asked if I could include the uh, SES school committee members, which I was happy to do. I wanted to thank publicly Sean Durrett, Emily Krems, Suzanne Ryan, Lou Vincent, and Aaron Faubel for the time and work they put into holding these study groups during their busy summers. I also wanted to thank school committee members, Carrie Etchells and Erica Boyd Jacob of Deerfield for attending both study groups, David Sharp of Deerfield for attending a study group, Olivia Leone of Frontier for attending one of the study groups and Peter Gagarian and Jessica Corwin for participating in both their study groups. Before I finished my statement, I was hoping to make space for people uh, anyone who participated and worked through the pathways to share your experience with the community and talk about um, what it was like for you and how it affected you. I don't know if there's anyone who would be willing to speak to that. I, I, we would love to hear how, how it was for you to go through that professional development. Thanks, Peter. Um, I would just like to say that I thought it was a wonderful experience uh, 
that you offered us and I would encourage any other school committee members uh, to work maybe with you to set up some time that they could do it. It was uh, eye opening in terms of the material and the discussion groups were, you know, you felt safe and secure and uh, it was easy to talk about stuff that is important. And so thank you. And thanks to uh, uh, Lou and Suzanne Ryan for hosting the one that Jessica and I went to. Thanks, Peter. Olivia, thanks for speaking. <laughs> sure. I just wanted to second that and say that um, I know it's a lot of work um, for you guys to be putting this together and holding these things. Um, and I absolutely appreciate that and um, hope that there'll be more coming up in the future. Well, thank you for sharing your experiences and thoughts. Um, the community members in the district have made it very clear that they want leadership around the topics of anti-racism and having schools that are inclusive, culturally responsive, and brave about having these conversations. We're asking that you all take the lead by joining the, this professional development. I would also like to offer the opportunity for Conway and Waitley school committee members, as well as any school committee members who did not join in a summer study group or who did not complete the study groups to have the chance to experience this learning opportunity. I would love to take names now, or you can uh, email me, jennifer.smith at frsu38.org. Um, for anyone who'd be interested in going through the first pathway or there is a second pathway, the history of racism that we could set up as study groups as well. So finally, I just to finish off, I'll take names later, but finally I'd like to share that um, coming up, we are working with the libraries and the Collaborative for Educational Services to offer a community education series of four workshops called Community Dialogue, Coming Together Around Culturally Responsive Education. This series of four workshops will begin in mid-November, so be sure to look to the town library websites and newsletters to get more information and sign up for the series. I really hope to see all school committee members there and as many community members as possible. And I would love to take names off the chat for people who would like to join a pathway study group or again, feel free to email. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank Thank you, Jennifer. Um, rather than have people respond immediately now, I'm going to ask that they respond via email, not just in the interests of keeping our, our meeting moving forward. But thank you for your efforts. I, I had a communication breakdown, um, partially, partially my, response, my, my fault and other things that I didn't get to participate in any of the uh, discussion groups, but I've started the pathways process. I have not had a chance to have a uh, conversation yet or, you know, sit down with a group. Uh, but thank you for the efforts. Thank you to Lou and the, and the DIG group as well. And we'll see if Lou's online now. <laughs> see how this, how she sounds now. Hi. Lou, would you like to, <laughs> hello. Can you hear me now? Yes. Great. <clears throat> awesome. Much better. Sorry about that. Um, Anyhow, I'm Lou Vincent. I live in South Deerfield. I'm a member of the Deerfield Inclusion Group. Um, I just want to say, you know, dear joint school committees, administrators, and community, um, I'm going to read a letter that we as did comprise to share with you. Um, the purpose of this letter is to update and inform you about the anti-racist professional development sessions that school committee members engaged in over the summer in partnership with members of the Deerfield Inclusion Group. The professional development program was created by DES teacher Jennifer Smith and anti-racist and equity advisor Amanda Mosea. Kim McCarthy, the director of elementary education, helped coordinate dedicated time in the PD calendar and the DES teachers were required to complete this professional development pathway last year. Our understanding is that this was a positive professional development experience for DES teachers. And we are grateful to Jennifer and Amanda for their work initiating and developing the PD program. 
The full PD program includes two pathways. The first pathway, identity and white privilege, and the second pathway, the history of racism. School committee members who participated worked through the first pathway. Participants engaged in multiple modes of learning, including reading articles, watching videos, self-reflection, -reflect and discussion. School committee members who attended were from DES, Carrie Etchells, Erica Boyd-Jacob, and David Sharp. From FRS, Olivia Leone. From SES, P Peter Gagarin and Jennifer Corwin. DIG members included Sean Durrett, Emily Krems, Suzanne Ryan, myself, and Aaron Falbel. The groups met two times over the summer and the work included both self-paced independent work and collaborative conversations with DIG volunteers. We commend these school committee members for recognizing the importance of engaging in this work. We believe it is critical for all educators and school committee members to participate in anti-racist education as we work towards more just and equitable communities for all the youth in our district. We encourage other interested school committee members to reach out to us if they'd like to learn more. Dig, and as Jennifer mentioned, she, we are happy to present this information again and, and to anyone who has yet to take this. It is truly a valuable offering that I think will just bring so much, so much to each and every life, every, your own and the children who will be affected by your own personal development. Sincerely, members of the Deerfield Inclusion Group, Sean Jarrett, Suzanne Ryan, Jennifer Smith, Lou Vincent, Emily Krems, and Aaron Fobble. Thank you all so much. I really personally appreciate it as a mother of children of color in the district. It meant a great deal to me to see your personal actual involvement in getting to know more about this. Thank you. Okay, and thank you again, Lou, for your efforts and the efforts of your team this summer. So <clears throat> um, uh, next we have a comment from Shelly Yagodzinski. Is she on? I didn't know, uh, there she is, yes. Yeah, Shelley, you... how are you? Good, thank you. So my public commentary, I just have two questions for the, the school school committee. Um, and the first one is, if you could please explain how the anti-racism and responsive education curriculum in the district differs from what is all over the news, also referred to as critical race theory. Um, and also how can parents opt their children out of this curriculum if they don't want their child or children being taught that the United States of America is systemically racist? And my second question is, um, can you please give an update on how the million plus dollars in COVID relief funds have been and will be spent? Thank you so much. I'm going to defer to Mr. Modesto. <laughs> yeah, um, I guess in the question, are we doing question and answers now? for um, um, during this, but um, I guess questions were asked earlier and we allowed it, so I'll, I'll try to give a, a general overview. Um, you know, you know, CRT in critical, um, you know, response education and critical response teaching is different than CRT that is being taught, that's being discussed by um, the media um, as a uh, liberal agenda to push through our schools and that kind of thing. What we're looking at is creating a culturally responsive classroom. That's looking at the students, and I've had this conversation already with you, Shelley, at the at the um, uh, Wheatley School Committee meeting, where I discuss what does it look like in the classroom when we look at all of our children and how they are learning, what their backgrounds bring to the classroom, and how our lessons interact with those backgrounds. And that is what is that is what we are doing here in our district. And um, you know, is there a way of opting out? Not clearly, because we are trying to embed it within our education, within our within our lesson plans. Um, and, and such. So um, looking at more diverse authors in our curriculum, do you want our child not to read certain colored authors or, or certain authors with certain backgrounds? I, don't, I hope that's not the, the what I'm hearing here, but that's what we're trying to do. Make sure that when we, we deliver a curriculum and I gave examples at the Waitley meeting, um, and it's a good one, I'm gonna use it again because it, it's so clear to explain what does it look like when you teach a classroom um, you know, um, when you're looking at the whole classroom, if you're doing a science project where many people can remember where you rub a balloon on your head, it creates static electricity. And you have, you pass out a balloon to all the students and all the students get to try that experiment. Well, if you're a student of color, um, you know, that, that, that doesn't work. 
And if you're not thinking about that as a teacher and understanding how your, your lessons interact with all students in the classroom and what that means, um, then you're missing out and, you, and the student's missing out and you're missing educating those students. And so we're looking at, you know, looking at our, our reading lists. Is it a diverse reading list? Are we getting all backgrounds represented? Because it, it is statistically a factual that students do better when they're learning um, about things they know and are liked. In, in their liked world, so to speak. And so, you know, if you're reading only, you know, white male authors, that's a problem. And we need to be looking at, you know, our reading lists and our, is our curriculum looking at all areas. So that in general is the overview of it. It can go into, I can send you links about how this is also coming down from the state as well, um, what to look for in a, in a <clears throat> CRT classroom. And that's critical, it's that critical race theory it's cultural responsive teaching. And it's unfortunate that the same anacronym is used in both places. So um, same initials rather used in the same both, in both places. So um, that's kind of the answer there. In regards to the millions of dollars being you know, provided to districts across. So you're probably talking about SR3 money. Um, we have a plan put forward that's been submitted um, about how that money will be spent. It's broken out over um, different categories and such, and we'll talk. We can talk more about that. I can't off the top of my head without you know that information in front of me. But basically, we went looking at infrastructure. We went looking at a percentage of it. I think close twenty percent has to be for mental health and well-being of students. Um, and looking at you know basically, we try to hit different pockets throughout the um, you know throughout the schools. So, and it, you know, if Shelly's on, she can go. If, people want us to entertain that further, she can talk about the uh, um, the direct amounts or she has that in front of her. And just wrong, Shelly, I'm talking about Shelly created business. I'm director. here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's not necessary. And and thank you so much for, for your answer. And I, and, and I really appreciate it. I do think though, if there is maybe a bit more transparency with the curriculum, because as, as you mentioned, you know, there's the same acronym to describe two different, two different things. So I'm just I, I'm just thinking that like the more transparency, the better. I mean, obviously, okay. I think that you're one example of you know, or should our kids only read white male authors? I never would have imagined that that's what is happening at at, at Wheatley Elementary. Um, but in regards to the line along the teachers' professional development, I do know that the the teachers at Wheatley Elementary were assigned to read the the book White Privilege, and so I do think that there can be some confusion ab ab about the curriculum. So the more transparency, the better. So thank you, Darius. Yeah, okay. Absolutely, Shelley. Okay. And, and follow up. I'll send you the. I'll send you the link, um, and maybe we can put it on the website regarding the. In fact, I will put it on the website regarding what to look for in a um, in a culturally responsive teaching and culturally responsive classroom. It kind of it kind of explains it a lot better. Um, is a nice little graph that's put out by the state for what to, what to look for. Well, it's kind of the backwards going in as an administrator, what to look for, and I guess as a parent, what to look for. And, um, you know, we aren't reading only white male authors in our district, but it was using it as an example of something that you want to make sure you're not doing, that you're looking at a full diversity when we talk about diversity of that. Okay. Thank, thank you, Darius. Um, did we? So uh, we'll move on, I guess, uh, to Allison Booth. Is she available? I saw I saw an Allison, but there she is. <clears throat> you need to unmute Allison. Can you hear me, Allison? <clears throat> Um, somewhere on your screen, you should have a microphone with a line through it. Try and click on that. Does anybody know the alt? Control D. Control, control D. D. Try hitting your control button in D if you're on a computer. So Allison, I'm Allison, I'm going to move on to someone else. Why don't you also try to sign out and sign back in, see if that helps with unmuting. Uh, Jill Dickinson, are you on? I'm here. 
Okay. Okay. Oh, I can't get the camera on here. Hold on a sec. That's control E. You give it a hotkey. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. I'm so sorry about that. Why don't you just, you can make your comment. We don't necessarily need <laughs> need the visual if uh, if you're having trouble getting it up. Okay, now you got both people speaking, oh. by the way. You have Allison, oh, sorry. Got her camera working, and you have Jill, who's trying okay, to Okay, go ahead, through. Allison, you were first. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, my name is Allison Booth Mayo, and I have children at both Frontier and Sunderland Elementary. I'd first like to say that it's really difficult at this point to understand why these meetings are still being held remotely. Most of our adult population in our communities is vaccinated. Um, I don't see any reason why a meeting like this couldn't be held in a large space like the Frontier Gym, as many school activities um, and events and community events as well are being held. Uh, for example, the Deerfield town meeting the other night was held in the, the Frontier Gym. <clears throat> Second, I'd like to take a moment to show some appreciation for the school administration. Though I'm far from happy that kids are still being subjected to overly restrictive COVID protocols, I'm thankful that the administration seems to be taking an approach that is not overly alarmist. As an example, I was thrilled that open houses at both Sunderland Elementary and Frontier were held in person. I would be here to speak out against mandatory masking once again, but due to the state mandate, this issue is moot with respect to the elementary schools for the moment. While it's possible that masking could be eliminated at Frontier for vaccinated students in the near future if state criteria are met, I don't support stigmatizing students by requiring masks of one group and not another. In this context, I would simply like to remind the committees that in imposing the district mask mandate before school started, a number of committees and Board of Health members committed to revisit the mask issue regularly with the goal being as I understood, a lifting of the mandate as soon as possible. Once the state provides greater flexibility with respect to masking, I would ask the committees to honor that. And that decision should be based on the extent to which COVID is an actual substantial threat to school communities and not as a coercive tactic by tying mask freedom to vaccination rates or status. Thank you. Um. Thank you, Allison. Um, as you as you noted, the uh, state has taken some of this uh, the decision out of our hands, and uh, we were, we are continuing to look at it. Um, so we can try once again with with Jill. I'm here. <laughs> you made Sorry. it. Sorry. Um, no, that's okay. <laughs> okay. So the last school committee meeting that I attended was the Sunderland school committee meeting. And I asked a very specific question. Um, it was whether receiving ESSER funds, any of them, one, two, or three, um, if CDC guidelines, like following those, such as universal masking, had anything to do with those funds. You guys told me no. I mean, and then I pulled up the state plan for the ESSER funds, which is right here. It's 62 pages. Page 14. Describe how the SEA, which is the state educational agency, will support its LEAs, which is the local education agencies, in safely returning to in-person instruction and sustaining the safe operation of schools. This description must include how the SEA will support its LEAs implementing to the greatest extent practicable prevention and mitigation policies in line with the most up-to-date guidance from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, CDC, for the reopening and operation of school facilities to effectively maintain the health and safety of students, educators, and other staff. And then right below, we have a table that says we've got universal masking, physical distancing, all that. So I, I just don't understand why when I asked you that, I was told no, when clearly the answer is yes. To receive your funds, you have, you know, your plan here, you got 
the masking and all that. Um, so that's one issue. And then, yeah, does anybody know how much the state got for co the ESSER funds? It's $2.4 billion. That's a lot. And I just feel like, not necessarily you guys, but the state, this mask mandate hasn't lifted maybe, you know, due to money. And that's what I feel like. I feel like our kids are being masked for money. Um, and it's really disturbing. But that's that's yeah. it. Okay, well, thank you for, for your thoughts. And uh, we will go from there. We, we are continuing to uh, run our budgets. And Shelly and the administration have uh, worked through their ESSER fund <clears throat> um, decisions. I, so, if I can just anyways, a clarification, go ahead. Of, from my understanding of the question that was asked at Sunderland, just for transparent, just so we can put that question to bed, was did the school have to do anything? Yes, I guess when you go, th the state gave out funding packages. I mean, the federal government gave out funding packages to the state, and like every funding package, they had some things tied to it. We are then tied to the state. So, I guess in essence, one tickles to the other, one goes to the other, goes to the other. But we as a district did not do anything different to get those ESSER three monies. The state of Massachusetts did. And then the state of Massachusetts had opening guidelines for safety protocols that they put on the schools. So in essence, yes, we are following federal restrictions on that money in order to open up our schools. But we as a district did not make any decisions around COVID in order to get funds if we wanted to get rid of masks to the district after the state releases it or do anything we want, right now we would still get those fundings as long as we opened up and we're in person, is my understanding. That was what the state is the one thing that they said we had to do. So I see the I see the thing there, but we're not responsible for those state decisions in following the money there. Um, yes. You know, the state's going to offer us hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, you know, we are going to. We're going to do, we're going to go after that if we can, if, if we can do it within our community. That's what we did. Okay. Thank you, Darius. <clears throat> so we are now through the public comment section and uh, we would move on to, at least on the agenda, approval of the minutes of April 6, 2021. <clears throat> do I have a motion from Frontier? Move to accept, Mr. Chair. I'll second Thank that. You. Thank you, Olivia and Bill. And I'm trying to see who was in here. The only person who was absent was Ashley Dion. So, uh, Judy, you want to do a roll call, please? Sure. Bob Halla? Yes. Yes. Bill Smith? Yes. Keith McFarland? Yes. Olivia? I'm going to go on by the first names now. Olivia? <laughs> yes. Judy? Yes. Damien? Yes. Lynn? Yes. Mary? Yes. Missy? Yes. And Phil, did Phil join? I don't think he did. did no, he? he's still in a meeting. Okay. That's okay. Thanks. Okay. Um, I would entertain a motion from a uh, voting representative, Union 38. So moved. Um, Second. Thank you, Carrie. And that was uh, Gary. Gary. Okay. And. I'm going to assume, uh, I will do a roll call by committee. Um, Elaine, and these will be voting members only, I'm sorry, but uh, <clears throat> Elaine Campbell? Yes. Michael Merritt? Yes. Uh, Phil's not here yet, so. <clears throat> um, Gregory Goshalk? Yes. Um, Jessica Corwin? Yes. Is Megan on? Megan Arkin? Yes. Yes. Good, thank you. Uh, Deerfield School Committee, Ken Cutterback, yes. Carrie Etchells? Yes. David Sharp, are you on, yes. David? I'm on, okay. yep. <clears throat> All right, and for Waitley, Maureen? Yes. Bob Halla? Yes, sir. Bethany Riley? Yes. Okay. Very good. It's unanimous. Thank you all. We are now 
Darius, we can go to the presentation, the MCAS overview. All right. Strategic planning. I want to welcome Sarah Mitchell, our yes. Director of Education. And uh, Kim McCarthy is unable to be here this evening, so Sarah and I will be taking on the presentation here. And um, Sarah, do you want me? Are you on and okay? I'm on and set. Yep, if you could share your screen, that would be great. I'll share my screen and... Good one. Your screen Interesting screen. Upside down and diagonal. No. Yes. <laughs> All right. Let me, um, you know what it is? Because I have a double screen. So let me go and share a different way. Might make it more interesting the other way. Stop presenting. Wow, that's weird. <laughs> How about I'll do a window? And then the window is too many things open. Sorry. Doesn't have it as a window option. All right, let me try it again. Did that come up? Normal? Nope. Wow. <laughs> well, we can leave it like that and I'll just talk at you. And those of you who are very creative with your computer screens and have laptops, you can flip it around and do all sorts of interesting things. I've never I've never seen a screen present quite like that. Do you want to carry on anyway, Darius? And I tried one more time. Did it work? Oh, there we go. You got it. You got it. All right. Excellent. All right. Well, it's actually appropriate that um, MCAS was um, a little messed up in the screen presentation because it was a very interesting year for MCAS uh, statewide and district wide. So next slide, Darius. So um, there was no testing in 2020. So we had a skip in a year of testing. Um, they did administer MCAS last year, and they allowed students that were in grades three through eight to either test remotely or to test in person. Um, we had a lot of students come in for testing, but we had a fair number of students that uh, chose to participate remotely because they were participating in uh, remote instruction. We did have over 90% participation in the schools um, as a whole, and um, some of the schools were much higher. Some of the schools were actually 97 or 98% participation. So a fairly strong high participation rate. Um, and we feel that that's important because we really wanted to see what would happen last year. I mean, we had such interrupted learning. Um, it was school like we have never seen school before. And MCAS has been a fairly static um, assessment in our um, history in the district. So they did modify the graduation requirements. So students that are currently in grade 11 and 12 are exempt from the science, and students that are in grade 12 are exempt for both ELA math and they are exempt from science. So they did that fairly early on. Let's go to the next slide. So I did some data analysis, um, and we looked at the percent of students that were meeting or exceeding expectations and compared those to the state. Um, and in order to make the data a little bit more powerful, instead of just um, taking it school by school and grade by grade, it can get very nuanced. Um, you know, we have some class sizes that are very small in certain elementary schools, and there's just not really enough power behind that to get a full picture of what's going on. So we did combine the three through eight data at each of the schools. We'll go on to the next slide. And I'd like to just tell you what happened at the state level overall. Um, so in ELA, there was an 8% drop 
and from 52% to 46%. We're used to seeing those numbers in our schools. We'll see big increases and big drops depending on what class is coming through. They do typically do not see that type of drop at the state level. You might see a one or a two. In a really unusual year, you might see a 3% difference because they've got thousands and thousands of students. There's a lot of power behind those numbers. So an 8% difference in ELA is a big difference. And then math, a 16% difference is a huge difference. And I think that speaks to the difference between ELA and math. In a typical day, we come across things that we're reading, we're having to understand text. In a typical day, we're not doing a lot of math. We might be doing the discount in the grocery store, but students aren't really coming across that a lot. And it really speaks to the importance of instruction. Um, I think this as a state level and when we look at our school data, there was this fear, um, I remember 10 or 12 years ago when we were introducing a lot of technology, and I'm not talking about our district specifically, but just kind of across the state, that what was gonna happen when we got all this technology into classrooms and we weren't gonna need teachers anymore, right? We're gonna be able to cut some teachers here and there. And there were a lot of conspiracy theories going on about what was the importance of educators. Well, I think this year proved the importance of having teachers in the classroom. It proved the importance of having students getting high quality instruction, in-person learning. All of those things really do matter. And this data, it really speaks to that. Let's go on to the next slide. So specifically here in our district, um, at, with ELA in our elementary schools, our students met or exceeded the standard at the same rate or a higher rate than the state across the board. Um, so for example, uh, Waitley Elementary School, 63% um, of our students met or exceeded the standard compared to 46% at the state. So we had a uh, 17% higher amount of students meeting or exceeding that standard. Let's go ahead to math, Darius. Um, so the math uh, was a little bit, we were a little bit lower in math. Some of our elementary schools were below the state um, percent of students that were meeting or exceeding that standard. Um, but we had a fair number of elementary schools that also way above that meeting or exceeding the standard. And it goes back to what I was saying about math and getting uh, being exposed to math kind of in general in the um, general environment. So we're looking at the support services uh, that we can put in place to accelerate learning. So we get students back on track so that this year when they take MCAS, we should see a lot of growth because students are going to ramp up that instruction and um, really accelerate where students are and where they need to get to. Let's go to the next slide. So at the secondary level, the ELA scores were quite strong. Um, in some grade levels, uh, the scores were actually stronger than they are in a typical year. Um, when you look at that kind of data, you say, wow, that's, that, it's, it's very interesting in this time of MCAS. Um, and I think it speaks to the strength of our teachers and the ability of them to meet the needs of the kids despite the pandemic. Um, so for example, grade seven, there were 66% 6 more students. Grade eight, 11% more students. And at grade 10, 15% more students that met or exceeded that um, level of meeting or exceeding the standards. Uh, so let's go ahead to the second slide. And similar story in math. Um, for grades seven and eight, um, we were still above the state average for grades seven, eight, and 10, but we did see a decrease in our overall performance in math. But in grade seven and eight, we had 7% more students that were meeting or exceeding the standard. And in grade 10, um, we had 13% more. So 65% of our students in grade 10 met or exceeded the standard uh, despite, despite um, MCAS. And let's go ahead to science. Uh, science was strong across the district in grades five, eight, and nine. Um, we were above the state average in all of those grade levels and in all schools. Um, an example is in grade nine, we just switched over to the biology assessment from the science technology assessment. We were really wondering how that was going to go. We did not have all of our students do the biology assessment because some students are taking biology in grade 10. So this is a slightly smaller number. But of those students that took the biology assessment, 91% of them met or exceeded the standard on that biology. So that was really, um, 
uh, made us feel good because we had just designed this course and our science teachers worked really hard to align those uh, standards with the, um, with the instruction that they were giving. So let's go ahead on to the last slide. Oh, no, sorry. Two more slides, I lied. Um, this year was the first year that we had to implement a civics engagement project. Um, you could select the grades you did that at the secondary level. We selected grade eight and grade 12. Uh, we had all of our students that completed that requirement this year, um, and they're doing it through a project-based uh, learning um, at the end of each year. Our teachers uh, participated in a pretty extensive professional development uh, the year before last and last year um, that really helped to gear up that civics project. We were uh, the recipient of a grant, I think I presented to that to you a couple of years ago, with nine other school districts in the area. We were the lead agency for that grant, and that grant allowed us to have an instructor um, meet with our students, I mean with our teachers virtually this year, um, and develop those civics projects. So we're really happy about that, um, that component that was added to the curriculum. Next slide. So despite the pandemic, um, our scores were, were strong, uh, which I think speaks to what we do in this district on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, we're gonna use this data to identify gaps so that we can continue to meet students' needs um, and really um, you know, fill in holes, particularly in math. Um, because that's the area that uh, was weakest across the state and that was the area that we really need to look at in our district as well. That's it. So, I mean, I think, and I also, you know, when you look at this kind of data, you're probably saying like, where's all the numbers? And so, you know, um, you know, we can share some of those, I, I, you know, we, Sarah and I had talked about how much do we share publicly, you know, there are different scores in different schools, you know, and so when you start talking about that, you also start talking about, you know, what was attendance rates, what were the size of the classes, what, you know, singles and teachers, was the teacher in the building and not in the building? There's a lot of moving parts on those scores. As the same with all the districts in Massachusetts, in the sense that, you know, you know, look at our secondary scores doing well, we, we performed very well. It, we also got things off the ground and running where other districts did not. They also had a participation rate that was very high where other districts did not. So there's a lot of moving parts in this year's numbers. And we talking, why are we even talking about it? Because we always talk about MCAS and to not talk about it this year when we have data to give um, is one of the reasons, you know, we're talking about it tonight. It's also <clears throat> in the papers and, you know, the press loves it because it's one thing they can wrap their hands on. Um, here's their your MCAS scores. When we use so much more, and we'll talk about it a little bit in our strategic plan, we use so much more other data assessments when we look at students. This is just one point that un unfortunately or fortunately it becomes a, um, a talking point in the newspapers and then among town and where's your scores and my kid behind because my scores aren't there. Um, and so, you know, we're gonna be looking at those scores as Sarah said in that last, most importantly in that last slide, to be looking at where are our gaps and where do we have to have student growth looking for next year? It's really about student growth not about um, you know the scores itself. So um, I guess questions if, as we talk too much probably. Do we have any questions out there? I sure, I'll chime in question. So it's interesting that um, you know seventh, eighth, and tenth scored very well relative yet in math, yet the elementary didn't. Any theories as to behind kind of where there was slippage more in elementary than there was in the secondary? Yeah, so it depends on school by school. Um, so some school, some elementary schools actually had some very strong math scores um, that looked exactly like Frontier. And a couple of our elementary schools had um, less weaker scores. Um, one of the factors at the elementary level is we have um, a lot of specialists that are working with students usually on a day-to-day -day basis, particularly in math and ELA um, to support students. And all of those specialists were used last year to man classrooms because we had students that were remote and we had students that were in person. So there wasn't that ability to double dip students in math in particular. Um, and so that's, that's a big factor in all of this for elementary. So this year will be a little bit more normal. We'll be able to double dip students. We'll be able to look at the data. Um, and so I, I'm thinking there'll be a stronger performance. That's great, thanks.
Any other questions out there? Okay. And Darius, why don't we move on to strategic? Sorry, okay. can, this is Maureen Nichols. Can I just ask one question? Sure. I can't mute quick enough. Oh, um, that's okay. So are, I, I'm just wondering, are we using MCAS then to assess um, any learning um, loss due to the pandemic? Is that, are we using any other, any measures? Yeah, absolutely. So MCAS is, it's one data point. Um, but as Darius said, there's a lot of noise around that data point this year because of the variability in instruction and the variability in what individual students did. So certainly that will be one of the data points. Uh, we also at the elementary level have, and up through actually through eighth grade, uh, grades three through eight, we have NWEA, which is a standardized national assessment that we can choose when we give it. So it was given this fall and that, um, points to the same areas in MCAS. And so it's very consistent. That's why we like that instrument. Um, there's a lot of individual data that's collected, particularly around reading um, at the elementary level. Uh, there's math assessments that go all the way up um, the grade levels. So we have lots of other assessment data that we're using. MCAS is one data point. We'll certainly look at it because I think it's important to, to see where the big holes are so we can make sure that we fill those in. Um, but yeah, we have, we are very data rich, uh, district. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else? I don't guess. All right. Yeah, I don't think so. You can feel free to come up with one later. Obviously it's your meeting. Um, sure. the next thing I want to present is our strategic plan. So basically, you know, we created a three-year plan that, um, expired at the end of 22. But over the last two years, we really had a lot of not, we actually made some progress within the plan, but there's some other things that were put on hold. So, you know, we discussed it, looked over it the summer and decided to update the, the current plan that we had, change some of the dates, um, uh, kind of fiddle a little bit with some of the goals and, and how we're getting there, obviously um, increasing certain areas where um, that we've been changing what we're working on. And so we're just gonna kind of run through it tonight. We can go in this as much depth as you want. Um, I think Sarah and I talked about just kind of going over the headlines and kind of kind of a quick overview, but if people want us to go in, you know, into each line and that kind of stuff, simply just ask um, because I don't know how far deep you want to go into it. So I'm gonna, again, I'm gonna share my screen here. Um, and I think I know how to do it now. Strategic plan, sure. All right. So this was shared with all of you. <clears throat> All right, and so we'll kind of skip right to the, you know, I'm not gonna read out loud to you as we've already talked about that. That's not what we like to do at school committee meetings. Um, and basically, so Sarah and I are gonna kind of go back and forth and talk about this. And so Sarah, you wanna talk a little bit about objective one, direction and expectation for learning? Sure, so it's very important, obviously, that we have clear learning objectives for our students. Uh, districts that do not have clear learning objectives tend to get what they get. Um, we follow the state standards, but in addition to following the state standards, we really uh, refine those standards and make sure that they say exactly what we are doing. So for example, in the elementary report cards, the standards are listed there. Those are the standards that teachers are measuring. Um, one thing that we have to do with those standards is make sure there's vertical alignment. So grade one standards are not harder than grade two standards or the things that you're learning in grade one lead into what you're going to learn in grade two as opposed to skipping around. And that's some of the work that we have been doing and we will continue to do. We could have a glitch here, right? <laughs> I can't see the screen, so someone's gotta tell me if there's a problem. Yeah, no, I think you're good on my end, but um, well, you and know I'll just go. I'm just gonna go right into the second one since yes. you've got up there. Um, so the second one is talking about horizontal alignment. Um, so this is particularly important at our elementary uh, level because we have four elementary schools. We've got one middle high school. And so there's a lot, um, it's a lot easier to do horizontal at the middle and high school. It's more challenging to do vertical alignment at the middle high school. At the elementary level, it's more challenging to do horizontal alignment. In other words, is the grade one classroom 
is that doing the same thing at one school as it is at another school? Um, so that's what that means. And, and, and within our district, that's one of the most important things. We've talked about that and the importance of, you know, Kim McCarthy's position in, in making sure that, you know, when a student comes out of, you know, one town, it looks the same as the student coming out of another town. Um, and all students are, are receiving the same um, quality instruction. Okay, and then, so that's strategy number one. Strategy number two is the delivery model reflects the core values of the district. Um, and then basically that's going into, um, you know, a lot we, we talked about a little bit earlier, but looking at differentiation, project-based, you know, and <clears throat> how are we approaching learning? Um, and that, that's kind of consistent across all classrooms. And are we doing um, the multi-tiered support system, basically um, getting interventions when they're necessary? And each school district has developed teams um, to make sure that we're getting those support systems in a timely manner um, for students that are struggling. If I miss, if I miss anything, Sarah, please jump in. So. Um, professional development, obviously that drives the boat on a lot of this work and that we do a whole professional development um, plan with for you in the spring of each year that explains where we're going and how that interacts with this work here. So this professional development, obviously within this goal, within this, um, is, is this strategy, but obviously it, you can see it throughout all the objectives. Professional development drives the bus in what we're doing in all the different areas of, of professional development. I'll pause any questions on that area. I can't see anybody, so you have to speak up. Hearing none, always can jump in and ask later. Um, you know, objective number three is assessment and feedback. You know, looking at, we like to be called, consider ourselves a data rich, rich district. And that's what we were talking about earlier is what are we looking at for assessments? How are we calibrating those assessments and common assessments across, um, you know, different grades in different buildings? Um, looking at report cards and communication um, within that. And you could, again, going through each of those um, areas. Sarah, anything else you wanna throw in there? I kind of was really brief on that, but Sarah's the big yeah. assessment guru. Yeah, no, I think you I think you hit the highlights. Thanks. Sorry, my kid, he's got out of practice and he's asking why I'm not driving him home right now. <laughs> All right, take care of that. Um, and the last one is governance. Um, and I think that one's probably the easiest to understand if you're not in education, but basically looking at our policies and clearly written job descriptions is one of our strategies. That's an area where we did not get a lot of work done because central office was really busy doing a lot of other things last, last two years. Um, and then um, working on communication with um, stakeholders. And one of the biggest um, things that we've talked about that's happening there right now is Parent Square, um, where we push out more information than we ever had in regards to communication um, and then kind of going through the different areas of stuff that going all the way down to with the school committee, looking at some of our, um, with our superintendent hiring process, it's a good time to look at that when you're not looking for one, hopefully. Um, I have my assessments later, my, my evaluations later, so I, mean, that's, I hope that's the, the case. Um, and then, you know, looking at, you know, how we're working that way. And then also, um, you know, strategic capital planning improvement plans and such. So you guys can read through all of that. Um, but those are, th that is our strategic plan. So let me stop sharing here so I can see faces. Um, we've extended it through, we've extended it through this year, through this year and next year where we can opt it. Basically what you do at the beginning of a strategic plan is then restart a full exchange plan where you take input about areas you want to go and that kind of stuff. But right now we're kind of midstream. I don't want to change horses as they say in the old saying, and we have pretty good goals that cover a wide variety. Um, I did send a note out to folks, you know, saying that, you know, what you will be seeing next month, um, if we can get them all done, is the school improvement plans, which are supposed to be reflective off of a strategic plan that's running the district. And so then you'll have more even input about exactly, well, how is this, how is this plan then being digested and delivered um, in the schools? That's kind of how it kind of works its way down. Um, it, again, this is our strategic plan as a district, and if people have ideas or like to see things, please shoot me an email or give me a call and we can talk about that. It is um, one of those plans where I think we're a small enough district where we're not rigid in our ways, in our direction. If we want to add a line or add, a, add those kind of things, or people right now have thoughts like, why aren't you talking about this in our strategic plan? You know, um, certainly you can bring those thoughts up and um, 
you know, we can see where we can put them in. But again, it, it is a general over, you know, overarching, you know, where the ship is headed, and then we finite it as we go through, as we implement it. Well, thank you, Darius and Sarah. Any anyone out there with questions? Um, actually, I have a question. I don't have a question, but Darius, I just wanted to touch base with you. I just got a text from the recorder saying that the streaming has another window. I didn't hear you. You broke up. The streaming is what? Uh, the streaming school committee streaming us is having connection issues. And then, um, yeah, and things have been dropped according to the recorder. So I'm not sure if there's anything we can do about that. There's nothing I can do about that. We are having internet issues at the school, and IT has okay. been working on it, as we know from the dozen emails you received this the last two days, George. Um, so I'm saying that to everybody. Our internet has been spotty here as they're working on recalibrating something. Um, unfortunately. So. It jumped on and said it was being recording now, so I don't know. So hopefully that improved it, but um, it is recorded, so we can post the full recording of this on YouTube, and people can watch it at their leisure and fast forward when they get bored. Right. Um, or they get excited. They can pause and watch it again. Well, two sides, two sides yeah. of the screen. Certainly, certainly that um, goes to part of the uh, – or part of my response to a question earlier tonight about why you know this is being conducted virtually, it's uh, um, everything has changed in managing public meetings under you know the uh, COVID protocols, and each committee had the opportunity to consider in-person meetings. We all chose to remain virtual because even if we're in person, we still have to provide a virtual component to the general population. And the logistics of doing that are um, very difficult, especially if you're in an in-person meeting um, where you're managing technology at the same time, <clears throat> you're trying to manage a meeting. So we all chose to stay virtual for the time being. Um, we hope to get back to in-person meetings, but it's not happening yet. And here's an example why uh, as we, are having some issues with our broadcast. So anyways, um, no other questions on strategic planning. We could move on in the agenda to ongoing committee business, the anti-racism and equity subcommittee progress update. So I don't have a lot to add from the last one other than I'm in the finalizing um, arrangement with a consultant. Um, as you know, the last one uh, was unable to perform um, their arrangement with us. And so I'm working um, with Sarah Mitchell on, I'm in my final, I'm reading my notes on the side, you see the side of my face here. Um, and so, but I do want to appreciate, I do want to thank everyone for their patience on this, especially the, um, especially the equity committee who we were supposed to have a meeting, our first meeting about two, I think about two weeks ago now. And then I know they want to get going. Um, I do want to get the consultant in place before we have our first meeting. So I hope that I hope to announce it hopefully later this week. Um, if we can kind of get things um, in place, I know it's been frustrating, but um, I am very excited about um, the opportunity that I think that we might be able to have um, the consultant that I got. Um, so again, expect communications from me on that in the next week or so, hopefully by the end of this week, but maybe early next week. Um, any questions on the equity work? And again, we haven't paused our work on that. Um, we paused our equity committee's work, meaning that our professional development is still going forward full speed. Our still, we're still doing, you know, the secondary, there are student groups and stuff that are meeting and doing their work um, around equity and anti-racism work. So just letting people know that it's not like every, nothing stopped. I just, the, the committee itself has not got up and running for these next challenges. Um, okay, questions on that? Want to go right into COVID? COVID-19 update. COVID, again, I'll be really brief about it. I think it was talked a little bit about earlier. Um, we are still with masks until November 1st. Um, some of you had your school committee meetings after that announcement came out, I think, because I feel like I've talked about this before. Um, but right now we're still outside of um, 
outside of um, the November 1st deadline, we're still under a local uh, Board of Health mandate and we're still under school policy, school committee policy. So nothing's gonna change overnight without us having meetings to discuss. I, I'm gonna tell you right now as a school leader, um, I don't recommend any change in the mask policy um, at this time. Um, and I think, and I'm gonna give you my main reasons for doing so is we are running school pretty darn normally right now. And we're doing what our job is to do is to educate students. And I think right now, if you were to take masks off, um, I think the um, transmission in classrooms, which we have proven does not, has not happened yet. Um, you know, it's funny that I just left the meeting, which means that computer just broke up, which means we're gonna have to post the recorded meeting. Um, so, um, but anyway, where I was going is I get lost myself, is that, you know, we haven't had any classroom transmission um, of COVID that we know of. And I think it's due to masks. And right now we're allowed to have our classes run almost as normally as possible. If you ask students, yeah, it's annoyance, but you know, they have plenty of mask breaks and they're doing what they need to do. Um, and I think right now, I don't want to interrupt that until we have a pretty solid plan of what that's going to look like. Um, I agreed with what Allison said earlier, they do have an exit on ramp or exit off ramp, if anyone, I guess how you're driving, um, about where you can get 80% vaccination status in your schools and that'll allow those students who are vaccinated to go maskless while you have those students who do not. That's you know crazy talk when you're talking about that right now where we know that the um, that the, the virus can be spread from vaccinated people as well. And you're gonna start creating the scarlet letter type of situation in a building where you're gonna have people you know divided on based on choice and that kind of thing. And that's not something that builds community. So, um, you know, more to come on this, but that's kind of the COVID update. Um, you know, I will say that, you know, we are writing things surprisingly very normal, um, minus the mask and, you know, obviously pool testing, which is the next thing on the list. Um, pool testing, um, turnaround on time has now increased. And we've seen that in the last two weeks as the rest of the schools have gotten on board. I see the rest of the schools of Massachusetts have gotten into pool testing. They were slower to roll out, um, not, not to their fault, but we were able to get it up and running um, faster with our communications with the company and some good luck, I think, as well, and some hard work um, by our nurses and uh, Meg Birch. Um, but the turnaround time is a little bit longer. For example, we usually you've got the next day. We haven't received ours yet as of an hour before this meeting. I haven't received Monday's testing yet. Um, and we have roughly about 71% of our population participating last week. I haven't got this week's numbers in pool testing. That's district-wide. Uh, yeah, I just have a question with the pool testing, with how it works. Um, if a kid, from my understanding, from what my kids have told me, Mondays are pretty much the day that they get tested. Uh, if they get a negative test, life goes on, no big deal. Um, if they come in with what I guess teachers, the nurse, whoever would appear, they have the appearance of being sick. And I'm not saying my kids are this way, but I just uh, hypothetically uh, asking if they appear sick, have a runny nose, whatnot, d does the negative test in the pool testing count? And if they are negative, then can they go to school? I'm, I'm hearing rumblings that that test doesn't doesn't count, and then they have to be sent home, and then they have to get a test from their doctor or pediatrician of a negative test before they can return to school. Why would the pool testing test not count? I'm first going to ask if Meg is on because I I can. I am. This, but I saw her earlier. Okay. I was going to say I think this one's for me. <laughs> so um, the the pool test because you're putting uh, five to ten samples in a in a test tube, um, and um, it's it is considered by DPH to be a surveillance test, not a diagnostic test. So there is no way to report a PCR result for an individual from that test tube. Uh, I thought, though, if, if the test comes back positive, then the families are notified that your child was tested positive. Well, so if the pool comes back positive, we do additional rapid tests to identify who the positive person is in I the see. pool. Right. So the PCR result is not tied. There's no way to tie that result to an individual. So it is not considered by DPH 
or the lab to be a diagnostic test. It is a surveillance test. Um, we do the, the rapid test um, to identify, as I said, the positive. Um, the Abbott Binex has a very um, high record of, of correctly identifying that positive. Um, we have not had to send out, we, we can say, say if we were to do that, that rapid test uh, following a positive pool and all of those rapid tests came back negative, then we would be able to send off individual PCRs to determine status of those individual members of the pool. Um, but, but the, yeah, that's, that's the issue with the PCR. The other thing to remember is if I take a, if I do a swab on Monday and, um, the pool I'm in is negative and Tuesday night I have a low grade fever and I don't feel great. That PCR tells, all it tells me is that Monday when I was swabbed, there was not enough viral load for me to be considered, you know, for, for COVID. Maybe I have something else Tuesday night, but I can't say that I don't have COVID on Tuesday night based on a PCR result that was taken, a swab that was taken the day before. Okay, that makes sense. And then just to clarify, does it do, do the parents have to take the child to a pediatrician or can you go up to like GCC or the UMass testing, whatnot, and get a PCR test that way? Uh, the, the PCR can, done, can be done at, um, at any location. Some, uh, some pediatric practices do have a PCR. Um, they'll do a PCR. They'll also do a rapid test that's equivalent to a PCR. Um, and it and is uh, considered acceptable in, uh, by the state. In, um, um, and but the GCC testing site, other other sites that do a PCR test are acceptable. OK, thank you. Thanks. And we do not have results back yet. I keep checking. Okay. Any other questions on COVID? I mean, pool testing. Thank you, Meg. Uh, I'm not hearing any. We should. We can move on to new business. Superintendent's evaluation. Um, it's uh, almost ironic that it's under new business because this is something we all completed back in April, or those of us that participated in it completed back in April. Um, and my apologies for <clears throat> not having processed or gotten a summary out to the committees so that we could have dealt with it in the spring when, when it would have been much more appropriate to, uh, to uh, conduct the evaluation. Um, we sent out a memo yesterday, Bob and I, uh, summarizing our thoughts on the data that was provided out of the evaluation, um, as I noted in that the cover memo that, uh, I mean, as I noted in that, that document, we had 22 respondents out of 25 people. Um, we had uh, four primary um, areas that uh, people were able to provide an overall rating on, and those numbers, uh, came out to show uh, if you average out over the four um, individual uh, items, it comes out to about a 55% rating of exemplary versus 45% rating of <clears throat> um, uh, proficient. proficient, I'm sorry. That's up. <laughs> and, uh, as uh, Bob and I discussed it, we felt that uh, given the circumstances, given the incredible effort by all involved uh, with Darius's leadership, that we felt a performance rating or a performance evaluation of exemplary for the 2020-2021 school year for Darius Modesto was warranted. So that was our recommendation to the committees. Um, we tried to get the full survey results out to you yesterday. I don't know if people, everyone was able to open it. Um, I neglected to say that you needed to be in your frontier um, email accounts to open the survey and get the comments and everything involved. Uh, my apologies for that. I thought I had given 
fairly clear, yeah, but then I was out of town and trying to get onto it on my phone oh, and I couldn't. So. Hospital. I'm so Anyways, sorry, but I really so, need to be in this meeting. I'm Jessica, lucky. you're unmuted. <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> That's okay. Don't worry. I just, you accidentally unmuted. Um, so that was uh, our recommendation. Uh, I, again, feel that uh, given the nature of 2020, 2021, which is in my 30 plus years serving on the school committee uh, is by far the most uh, difficult year that uh, we've ever experienced as a school community. And I, I personally just, you know, after reviewing the, the data and uh, every, taking everything into consideration, feel that um, Darius's leadership was exemplary. So, Bob, I don't know if you have any comments. Yeah, I mean, when we went through it back in April and stuff and everything was going kind of crazy there, and then when we brought it brought it to the committee here and, and shared our information, Darius and I were talking about the other day that we're going to get out. We have a lot of new members um, that are on the different committees that will be able to fill out something. I think we're talking January and February of this year, and we'll submit it to a group uh, in our April um, April group meeting that we'll have then. So we'll have a chance for the new people and, you know, us that did it last time, we'll be able to do another, another survey evaluation of Darius at that time. And, and one last thing I would say is, and Darius has uh, said this repeatedly to me over the ensuing months is, if there are performance issues that anyone feels need to be addressed, please get in touch with Darius, get in touch with your chairs, get in touch with whoever so that we can, you know, so that he can respond and, and deal with any, any issues that people see arising. So we, we don't need to wait for the evaluation process to provide feedback to any of our administrators. And we should be doing that as necessary. So um, with that being said, I would open it up for comments from the full committee and uh, see if anyone has anything they want to add or subtract. So everybody jump in at once. And <laughs> yes, Peter, Peter. Um, I just like to say that uh, obviously, I agree with your assessment of Darius's performance. I thought it was clearly exemplary and, and under the circumstances, really quite remarkable. Um, the, the one thing I wanted to add was that um, I was pleased to see this go around that there was a real good participation by the school committee in terms of the number of people that absolutely time and effort to, to go through this and based on the written comments to put some thought and time into it. And I, my recollection is that that's a lot better than, than the previous time around. So I would uh, just uh, like to note that and hope that we can continue even to improve on that because it's it's important that Darius get our feedback and uh, that's one of the, our obligations as school committee members. Yes. yes. Thanks, Peter. Thank you for that, Peter. Do we have anyone else? My goodness. No. Okay. Um, I think we. I'd like to see us, I know it doesn't say vote here, but I think we as a committee would be remiss if we did not vote a, um, you know, an evaluation summary <laughs> for- yeah, we, both, we actually do have to vote this. Right, so, um, so you have a recommendation, and Bob, I don't know if you wanna start with Frontier or- um. Do I have a motion to accept the evaluation of the superintendent for 2020, 2021? Evaluation recommendation. Yep. Yeah. Moved. Second. Was that Lynn? Thank you. Bill, you second? Yes, sir. And we'll do a roll call. Judy? Bob? Yes. Bill? Yes. Keith? Yes. Olivia? Yes. Judy? Yes. Damien? Yes. Lynn? Yes. Mary? Yes. Missy? Yes. Great. 
That's everyone. How about for the union? Do we have a motion? So moved. Second. Is that Carrie again? Yes. Yep. Okay. And for this, I'm going to um, call on everyone, even though I know we have voting members, but I just think it's it's fair to all committee members if they want to, uh, you know, provide us with their input. So um, we'll go right through the full list, <clears throat> starting with Elaine Campbell. Yes. Michael Merritt. Yes. <clears throat> Philip still not on, I assume. Uh, Jared Campbell. Yes. Is Denise on? Didn't think so. Um, Gregory Gottschall. Yes. Jessica Corwin. Yes. Megan Argon. Yes. Keith McFarland. Yes. Peter Gagarin. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Deerfield School Committee, Ken Cutterback, yes. Terry Etchells. Yes. David Sharp. Yes. <clears throat> Mary Raymond. Yes. And Erica Jacob. Yes. Thank you. And finally, Waitley School Committee, Maureen Nichols. Yes. Bob Halla. Yes. And Bethany Riley. Yes. Excellent. Thank you all very much. Um, and Darius, thank you and your entire team for just an amazing job in a very difficult times. So thank you. <clears throat> um, public comment, guideline for public comment. So Ken, just to, to comment back on the, thank you for the evaluation. Um, once you receive an evaluation like that, the first thing you do is negotiate your contract. No, I'm just <laughs> um, um, but no, I really, I wanted, <laughs> what I want to do is, is is absolutely, you know, it's um, it's also a tribute to the administrative team and all the people that support the administrative team all yes. the way down through mm -hmm. the entire, um, you know, our entire from teachers to support staff to everybody that works in the schools. But um, when I look at the administrative team, I really want to thank them because they're the ones that um, help me look good from time to time when I'm not messing things up. Um, and I also want to just say, you know, the first thing you also do is compliment your boss when they compliment you. Um, but really, we do have a very difficult community committee set up. Mm -hmm. And you guys do need to tip your own, someone has to tip their hats to all of you, and I will do that now on behalf of the community, because you guys did, and you continue to work well together in a really messy kind of, when we talk about we're in joint committee now with 25 people with a lot of different backgrounds and that kind of thing, and through a very stressful year. And while, you know, certainly it was stressful on the schools, it was also very stressful on you. And a lot of you didn't, because say you didn't sign up for that um, as well, but it's, you were supportive of the, um, the school, you're supportive of the kids, um, and were supportive of me, even if I misstepped along the way. And I, so I want to um, thank all of you because it does, it does make a difference. And when you look at school committees that aren't functioning well, um, a district can <clears throat> very quickly. And so I want to um, thank all of you for um, your work on that. Oh, okay. Thank you. All right. Um, public comment. And, so, and now he wants a raise. And now <laughs> I would never do that. <laughs> okay, email um, no, the, so the next thing is I want to talk about is, so I sent out the guidelines for public comment. Um, so I threw, basically, I went and looked, researched what other school districts do. They have a school committee policy, and then they have a guidelines for, for public comment. And we talked about what would be read at the beginning of public comment so that we um, solve any issues that, you know, some of the issues that we've had in the past we've already talked about. So, um, anyways, I presented that. To me, it's a little long, you know, um, but I put it all in there because it, I didn't know what to take out, and I kind of wanted, it's your document, and we don't have a policy sub, we do have a policy company. We didn't put the policy subcommittee together to, to do this, so I figured we'd look at this tonight, make some recommendations, and vote it at the next meeting, at your individual meetings as policy in November, if that works for you. 
Um, and then we can kind of wordsmith or make it shorter, or that kind of stuff. But this is me. You asked me to create a, um, rules for public comment. And this way, it's a policy and it's an extension of your current policy of public comment. So um, I can share my screen. I don't know how you want to do it. Do you want to look at it that way? Or people all, I think people all have their computers in front of them. Tell me what to do. Why don't you put it on the screen? Yes, sir. Please. Yes, sir. All right, so looking at it, the, um, you know, basically introductory, you know, about this. And then, you know, there's this is the chapter and verse of the law um, that I stole from another district that basically, you know, people can't come out to public meetings and be disruptive. And it kind of gives a clear outline of the law. It's also repeated later on in the general rules for public comment, but I'll go through the general rules of public comment. You know, we talk about three minutes, so that's no change. Um, and the, the chairperson may extend the, the time limit at their discretion. Topics of discussion must be limited to those in the meeting agenda um, or within the, the scope of the responsibility of the school committee. That, you know, people can't come in and complain about, you know, the president of the United States or something like that sort. Um, improper comments, remarks will not be allowed. Deflammatory, abusive remarks are always out of order for speakers. I'm reading out loud to you what you guys hate. So um, kind of going through it, it's a little long to be read at the beginning of every meeting. Right. So, um, but I didn't know what to take out because some of it is important. I didn't, I was stuck and it's your thing and this is all the important rules. So maybe the chairs get together with you and see if we can scrunch it down a little bit so we can have something to read before every public comment. That's I'm, not trying to, I'm not trying to create more meetings, but. We probably could create this out in 10 minutes because it's all there. It's just about, it's a little bit of wordsmithing, I guess. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Damien has his hands up. Maybe he can share something with us. Oh, it's not not anything to uh, to shrink it down, but I, maybe I just don't know the the protocol or the law on it. Um, but you know, we have a list of who the public commenters would be, and rather than this having to be read at every meeting, could it be in print form that this could then be emailed or a sheet, and eventually when we get to um, in person you know, a, a printed copy given to all the public commenters. I, I don't know if that's legal or not. Legal wise, you can do whatever you want. You could have this sent out with anybody asking for public comment. You know, you could do an affirmation that the person <clears throat> comment have, you know, understand that the rules and guidelines. Um, clearly, you know, sometimes we don't have public meeting at all. I mean, a public comment at all. And so would you right. need to have a public comment? Obviously not, um, you know, that kind of thing. So. I think there's some discretion maybe that the chair has to read it or not based on the number of public comment or the anticipation of a, of a controversial subject um, where emotions may carry people outside the rules. Sure. Judy, you want to, Judy, Judy. you're next, Judy. Yeah, I wanted to ask about, like in your survey of uh, other people's policy, did you see anything about, you know, you talked about our unique meeting structure and we have been having meetings within meetings. Um, I'm thinking primarily the Board of Health where it doesn't feel like we have uh, shared uh, obligation to manage public comment and yet we do have a shared obligation to manage public comment. And I know it's an extreme case, but I don't think it's gonna disappear. <clears throat> in the future and I'd love to see a or I'd love to know if there's been any conversations between the boards about how to manage that sort of thing that sort of type of meeting specifically um I have not and I think you're you kind of hit something on the head that when we do those kind of joint meeting in the future we have to have clear where the clear responsibility rise lies you know when you have multiple like in this meeting alone we have two chairs running a meeting yeah. um you know, Ken and Bob have done it long enough where they kind of work off each other, um, like those two Muppets there. Um, but the, uh, I got my evaluation, I could say stuff like that. <laughs> the, but, but you're exactly right. If we have to have another joint meeting with the Board of Health, 
we're setting ourselves up for the same systematic failure of whose policy are we running off of? Yeah. You know? um, and I think if we're hosting the meeting, I think it's whoever's hosting the meeting is technically in charge of running the meeting. So if we get invited to a meeting, that it is that host's meeting. And what happened there is they had us run public comment for a variety of reasons. Um, and, you know, I think it got messier than it had to be. Right. And we didn't anticipate that. But I think we can try to fix that. Judy, I don't know how we'll do that, but I think we can. Yeah. Olivia, you want to you wanna share something with us? Sure. Um, I had a similar thought to what Damien was um, saying. You know, when we're in person, we could have it, you know, on paper. But at the beginning of the meeting, we're all like waiting for everyone to arrive. Is there a way if this is what it's going to be? Is there a way for this to be up on the screen? So everybody who's as they come to the meeting, they're seeing that this is what's expected of them as behavior. Um, and that way, either, you know, you guys could just say these have been posted. If you have any questions, feel free to ask, you know, Bob or Ken, but that this is what's expected of you. And that way it's kind of posted in written form while we're online. And then when we can go back into person, it's also written in person because I think saying it is great, but if someone isn't on at the very beginning or someone, you know what I mean? So having it be present at some point on the screen might be a good idea. <clears throat> And Missy? Yeah, I, I also just think that maybe it's it will be helpful to have, I don't know, maybe even a run through of a scenario um, for if you hear something and you'd like to comment on something, how would you approach that through uh, the chair? Mm -hmm. So I, th I think it would be helpful for all of us as members to just kind of have an example as, as we go through for how we might bring up an if something seems out of context and the chair didn't catch it how do we kind of help to make sure those things get addressed in in real time sure. and what's the appropriate process for that I, I i'll i'll try and answer that i think these are all great points i like damien and olivia's uh ideas Right now, we're in a situation where, not a situation, but we have a protocol in place where people notify the school committee, and Donna responds back with an invitation to join the meetings, which is an ideal time uh, to do what Damien has, and Olivia are suggesting, is send them the protocols or send them this uh, list of ex expectations for public comment. Um, in the future, when we get back to face-to-face -face meetings, is there's a little less control, but we could potentially have sign-in sheets for public comments so that we're aware beforehand rather than uh, I've typically run meetings. As I've run meetings, I've just asked people to raise their hands, uh, but at least that way we have people that have signed up to speak and we can hand them the protocols at that point in time. Um, that's just a thought. So, um, but I like the idea of the chairs getting together and going through this list as <clears throat> as suggested. So, Bill, well, Bill. Yeah, I just, I wanted to comment. I think where we get into trouble with this is when we let it degrade into a QA and a session. Yes. Darius' point was right on point before. It's not, it is public comment. It's not a question and answer period. It's a comment period. Not like a public hearing on the budget where there's 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 witty repartee back and forth between us and the audience. This is all this is is public comment, and people who are asking to be heard need to understand that it is not a Q and A. And all of us, the eleven of us, should try to resist the temptation to take the bait. Okay, thank you, Elaine. Yeah, I just think, um, you know, the times we've just gone through are certainly unprecedented. And I think people, as long as we're remote, the chairs just need to have their button on ready to mute the people speaking who start to go out of line. Because um, 
you know, that's where the train comes off the tracks. And as long as we're remote, we have the ability to stop that. Now it's hard to predict, you know, where people are going, but we've certainly had some examples where people were way down off the tracks and should have been silenced before. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I certainly believe in freedom of speech, but I don't believe in uh, disrupting public meetings just for your own soapbox. So, um, and, and when we're in person, I'm sure the chairs, I mean, I've had to, as a chair, had to um, have people uh, be quiet uh, when they were out of line. Um, but hopefully that doesn't happen too often. And you can, can write all the requirements you want, and there's still going to be some people that don't follow them. Right, as you all right. know. So I, I don't think you have to twist yourself up into knots to get the exact right language or the right this, the right that, because if you're going to have the type of person that wants to do that, they're going to do it regardless of what you've written and what they've read. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks, Elaine. And Missy, do you have another Missy. question? I just want to kind of follow up that, that that's kind of what along the lines, I understand how the public comments are submitted, but I, I think when things look like they're getting out of track and nothing's happening, how do we as committee members help to say, hey, I, I don't want to step on your toes, but it looks like something needs to happen here to calm this down. How do, how do we help help that? A quick, okay, Missy, the, the quickest way to take, to address that is to call for a point of order with of, from the chairman. So just literally interrupt. If, if I'm not responding the way you think I should be, or if people think I've missed something, um, I, I heartily encourage them for it to call for a point of order. It's Robert's rules, and it certainly makes it easier. And when you're trying to to manage everything that's going on, sometimes we miss things. So that is the quickest and most efficient way to do it: is just say point of order, Mr. Chairman, Ms. Ms. Chair uh, or Chair, <laughs> point of order, Chair. Uh, this, this doesn't seem to be appropriate or it doesn't seem to be within the guidelines of our public comment policies. And so I, stop I it think right along then. with those public comment policies, kind of reminding everybody that we have permission to do that, you know, that that is part of the process. I think that that may help us all kind of feel a little more free to step up in those spaces. Okay. I appreciate the feedback. Thank you. Anyone else with thoughts? Do you want us to take this on as chairpersons and bring it back? What do you think, Darius? <laughs> Sounds like a plan. I think I, okay. I, I got a, a better idea of how we can we can kind of whittle it down and then put some parameters for it to use. Um, okay. And. Before uh, before we adjourn, um, I did want to recognize a teacher today. Um, Stacy Chapley got awarded Biotech Teacher of the Year. And I guess it's a big to do. And she's worked hard. And there's I guess there's a, some grant money that comes with it also that she's going to use in the classroom. Correct me if I'm wrong on that, Darius. I'm pretty sure that she can use it right in the classroom for other materials, other materials for her classroom. So, but it's a big, you know, big thing. I'm not sure if us as school committees can send a letter to her. She's probably not watching us, but um, I like to try to do something. What do you think? Or Allison, Allison's on somewhere, right? I think, yes, I'm here. I'm here. Do you think we should, should we do anything special or is that not? Okay. You know, I think, I think if, if the school committee wanted to write a, a letter congratulating her, that would be probably very nicely well received. And to recognize the teachers and the work they're doing, I think is, you know, it's worthwhile. Thank you, Allison. I'll work, I'll work on that the next day or so. Okay. So. Any other business? 
for anyone other than the Red Sox should win tonight, I hope. <laughs> Go Sox, and you got the meeting over before first pitch. Good job. <laughs> otherwise, uh, Frontier. otherwise, the chairs were going to be in big trouble. <laughs> Do I have a motion from Frontier for adjourning? Move to adjourn, Mr. Chair. I'll second that. And Judy, you want to do a roll call? Bob. Yes. Bill. Yeah. Keith. Yes. yes. Judy, yes. Damien. Yes. Lynn, I got confusing. Yes. Mary, yes. And Missy. Yes. Thank you. Okay. And uh, Union 38, motion to adjourn. So moved. So moved. Uh, Second. Elaine, second. Uh, quick roll call. I'll make it as even quicker by just going to voting members. Elaine? Yes. Campbell? Michael Merritt? Yes. Still here. Uh, Gregory Goshal? Yes. Jessica Corwin? Yes. Megan Ar Arkin? Yes. Uh, Deerfield School Committee, Ken Cutterback? Yes. Carrie Etchells? Yes. David Sharp? Yes, thank you. And Waitley, Maureen Nichols? Yes. Robert Halla? Yes, sir. Bethany Riley? Yes. We are adjourned at 7.39 p.m. All right, thanks, everybody. Good night, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Darius.